Suffolk Pod Show is produced and managed by podtalk.co.uk. I'm Mark Mason. And I'm Susanna Hornby. Episode 38. Susanna talks to Richard Granger, former international banker and founder of Clear Idea Finance. Welcome, Richard. Thank you, Susanna. (laughs) It's a real pleasure to be invited onto the Suffolk Pod Show. (laughs) You are so very welcome. Now, you've lived and worked around the world, predominantly Asia, but your roots are firmly here in Suffolk and Essex. Yes, that's right. Um, I've actually spent more than half of my adult life living in Asia, mostly in Hong Kong. But I'm a proud Essex and Suffolk boy, no matter where I've lived. I was born in Colchester and grew up and went to school there and in Ipswich, and I live in Ipswich now. So I went to an excellent local primary school in Colchester, Hamilton Primary School, Mm -hmm. but I wasn't able to emulate my older brother and pass the 11 plus, which Mm. would have meant that I went to Colchester Grammar School. Mm. Actually, my mum to this day still insists that something funny went on that year, (laughs) but I'm not I'm not so sure. Well, not all of us are straight A students. At such a young age, anyway. Um, I mean, we had other things on our minds. Yeah, we did, and and I had a very happy childhood um, filled with sports. I played a lot of games and sports with my brother mm-hmm. and and friends. We played cricket in the garden. <laughs> uh, we disappeared uh, for the day over the local fields with our friends on yeah. bikes. Oh. Um, and I have a I have a bit of a geeky side too. I played a lot of chess at school until I was about sixteen. And actually, to this day, one of my passions is backgammon. It's one of the oldest games in the world, much older than chess, actually. Uh, and in my view, it's the best game. In fact, I would say probably a week doesn't go by when I don't play online. Some people do a crossword puzzle or a Sudoku with their coffee mm. in the morning. I do. I play a bit of backgammon. <laughs> it's a shame not many people seem to play it these days. It was very fashionable mm. in the 1970s, mm. um, as Trivial Pursuit was in the 80s. But mm. uh, few people seem to play it these days. I probably have about 20 backgammon sets and maybe 40 books about the game, much to my wife's annoyance. <laughs> it's okay. You're in safe hands here. We're backgammon players. <laughs> So, oh, that's great. Yeah, I know. So your talents have always been in logic and numbers in that case. It's a certain sort of brain, I always think, that can play backgammon or chess at a reasonable level. Well, I, I think that's right. I suppose it's about logic, strategy, thinking ahead, mm. anticipating what your opponent's thinking. I think the major difference between chess and backgammon is that backgammon involves dice which introduces an element of randomness and Mm. luck. In chess, it doesn't matter how many times you play, a novice player will never be an expert, Mm. no matter how many times they play. Whereas in backgammon, a novice can beat a master, at least occasionally. So Mm. in my opinion, it's a much more interesting game. It's true. Mm. But I did play a lot of chess at school. Um, My mum wanted me to have the best possible education, so I took the entrance exam for Ipswich School and got in there. Mm. Uh, We weren't a particularly wealthy family. My dad was a sales rep. My mum had a few different jobs. Um, She did a lot of nursing jobs. Mm -hmm. and She made sure that we had enough money to pay the fees. Mm -hmm. Luckily, I was quite good at music. I played piano, violin, drums. I I was a singer as well. So I was awarded a music scholarship (laughs) when I was about 13, uh, which gave us a a nice reduction in the fees. Mm -hmm. But we knew Ipswich very well. My grandmother and actually my great-grandmother both lived here until well into my 20s. And it had always been a big part of my childhood Mm. with regular family visits, weekends, Easter, Mm. Christmas and so on. Mm. Um, And I I have very happy memories of running around Christchurch Park with my brother and cousins. (laughs) Lovely. So I know many people can be a bit sniffy or cynical about private education, but I have no doubt that I wouldn't have had the opportunities I've had in my life if I hadn't gone to Ipswich School. Mm. Uh, I wasn't especially academic. I was more of an Um, all-rounder. I did music and sports as, as well as the academic stuff. But I was always the kind of person that really needed to be pushed and stretched, even dragged. Um, And Ipswich School certainly did that. It was an excellent school and it still is. Mm -hmm. And I'm truly grateful that my parents, especially my mum with the various jobs that she had, made the sacrifices that meant that I could go there. And, And ultimately, that's... I think why Clear Idea Finance exists, it was partly to give my two younger sons the same education opportunities that I'd had 
And that's why I returned to the UK two years ago after more than 15 years in Asia. But we'll come on to that a little bit later. Yeah, no, definitely. But looking back now at the enormity of the focus for you on that miserable 11 plus, (laughs) I think you rather proved the system wrong. You went to Cambridge. Yes, I did. I I still can't quite believe that I went to Cambridge University. Um, It wasn't really ever in my plans. I'd studied French maths and economics at Mm -hmm. A-level and eventually applied to Cambridge to study economics. I didn't really have any serious thought that I might actually get in. But a few of my more academic friends were applying to Oxford and Cambridge. So I thought, why not? Yeah. I applied to one of the colleges, Sydney Sussex College, uh-huh. um, whose most famous students were Oliver Cromwell in the early 17th century. Yes. Um, in fact, his head is rumoured to be buried there. Ooh. And then TV's Carol Vorderman in wow. the 1980s. <laughs> oh, <right. laughs> <laughs> but somehow they gave me an offer. I yeah. got the grade that I needed and I got in and uh, that was one of the proudest moments of my life Mm. knowing that I'd been accepted by one of the best known universities in the world. Yeah, what a feeling. Yeah, Yeah, it it was. I've actually often joked that I'm the only person I know who got into Cambridge with only one (laughs) O-level because I was the first year group to take the new GCSE exams in 1988. Um, Mm. But I'd taken maths a year early when they were still O-levels. Anyway, before I started my degree course, I spent a year working for a TV company in London. It was owned by the father of a school friend. And that gave me a great opportunity to earn and save some money before going to university. University. Mm. I had a great three years in Cambridge, which to this day remains one of my absolute favourite places in the UK. Yeah. I've been there several times in recent years because my daughter, Emma, who's the eldest of my four children, she's about to take her final exams and hopefully she'll be graduating from Cambridge in a few weeks. Oh, well done her. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. She's much more academic than I ever was, that's for sure. Um, but I, I enjoyed it. I played a lot of sport there. I did uh, a lot of rugby, football, rowing, cricket, as much as I could really, mm. um, and did just about enough work to get a 2-1 degree, which I was delighted with. Mm. But to be honest, my real focus in Cambridge was getting a job, specifically a job in finance. Right. I think these days, the most desirable career path seems to be Silicon Valley, tech companies, Google, Amazon, yeah. finding the next so-called unicorns. But in those days, and this was in the mid-90s, it was really investment banking and management consulting that were considered the plum jobs. Mm. You graduated literally just before the tech boom, and and you have a passion for finance and economics anyway, so it was just a natural step for you. It was, and I applied to about every company I could could think of. (laughs) That's what we did in those days. (laughs) I know, and there was no internet to do this. And I I, I think about all the paper applications that I did. I'm Mm. literally... I applied to dozens of these companies, received a handful of offers and accepted one from Credit Suisse First Boston, which, as the name suggests, was a Swiss American bank. Mm -hmm. So I joined them. I spent a few months in New York on a very intensive training program, kind of a crash course MBA program Mm -hmm. where all the graduate recruits um, for CSFB from all over the world, I think there were about 150 of us lived and worked and trained together, which was a great experience. Uh, First time I'd been in, in the US and then spent the summer there and then returned to London. Uh, And so began my career in banking, Credit Suisse, in Canary Wharf, working absolutely brutal hours. Yeah, I can imagine. It's funny because the investment banking world often seems glamorous, and I can tell you it's not, especially in those early years when you're expected to work 14, 16-hour days plus weekends, um, at least you were in those days. Yeah, no, that was the thing, Uh, though, wasn't it? It was absolutely work ethic. It was. It was a real challenge. And I remember family holidays having, uh, getting cancelled because uh, an urgent work uh, situation came up. And, yeah. and that was what you that was what you were you were expected to do. But so it was a challenge, but it gave me um, it gave me an excellent grounding, I mm. think, in the basics of banking and finance, the corporate world. And I worked with some extremely impressive and talented people. But to be honest, it seemed more like an endurance challenge. Uh, In truth, I didn't really enjoy it that much. I I worked (laughs) to live 
Um, whereas a lot of people in that world seemed to live to work. Work was their absolute priority and they were prepared to sacrifice everything else. Mm. How things have changed today, because I remember burnout was commonplace in those days, as I've just said. And for those working in banking, they were given a shelf life almost. But you, but you did find time out of work. <laughs> yes, I, I, I did, just about. I, I got married for the first time in 1996, having met my my wife at, at Cambridge, actually. And then we lived in, in Leafy, Surrey, yeah. um, where I continued to play cricket and rugby. Um, our first two children, my first two children were born in 2000 uh, and 2002, both mm-hmm. before I was 30. Mm-hmm. And then after about three years with Credit Suisse, I joined what was BZW, a name that we don't hear hear often these days, but those old enough will will probably remember it. It was part of Barclays Bank uh, and then rebranded in the late 90s um, to become Barclays Capital and what today is, is now called Barclays Investment Bank. So I spent 12 years with Barclays uh, in two distinct halves. I spent six years in London, and then I spent six years in Hong Kong. I was part of the Debt Capital Markets Group, Mm -hmm. which was itself part of the investment banking division of Barclays Bank. We helped clients, typically banks and other financial institutions, to raise large amounts of money through the international capital markets. Mm -hmm. I really thrived in that environment, which Mm -hmm. became a bit less brutal as I became older and and more experienced, but it was still hugely stressful. The pressure was really high to perform, to win business for the bank in what was a highly competitive market where all the major names in banking, Goldman Sachs, Merrill Lynch, JP Morgan, Citibank, Mm. HSBC, and everybody else, everybody was competing for the same same business. But slowly but surely, Barclays Capital transformed itself from an old school British merchant bank into a modern, more American style investment bank Mm -hmm. capable of holding its own and competing anywhere in the world. And that's how I ended up in Hong Kong in 2003. Wow. Hong Kong, what an amazing place, but it had been, must have been just through an incredible change before you arrived. But obviously it was still a, a hotspot for global banking. Yes, it, it was. that The handover of Hong Kong from the UK back to China um, happened in 97. So yeah. it was a few years before I arrived. Yeah. I, the first time I went there was in 2001, and I fell in love with the place immediately. I'd already been in London with Barclays for six years. Things had gone a, a bit stale with mm. the job, and I was looking for a new challenge. Uh, an opportunity came up to go over to Hong Kong and essentially try to replicate the success that we'd already had in London, in Asia, Mm. and I jumped at the chance. Well, don't blame you. What a wonderful opportunity. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. So on my 31st birthday in 2003, which makes me 49, by the way, in case anybody's trying to do the the (laughs) mental arithmetic, (laughs) we uprooted from Surrey with our two children, Emma and William, who were three and one at the time, Mm -hmm. and settled into expat life in Hong Kong. What a move. And despite the euphoria of moving to such a wonderful part of the world, it didn't go quite as you expected. No, it, life in Asia didn't start as we planned. Mm. Literally, two days after we arrived, the newspaper headlines on the Monday morning, my first day at Barclays in Hong Kong, the headline was, Man Dies in Kowloon from Mystery Virus. I still have that newspaper. Um, and of course, that was SARS, or yeah. uh. SARS COVID-1, as it's now officially known. And it made for a very uncertain and worrying few months. Um, for a while, we there was even a chance that we thought we'd have to return to the UK. Really? And in mm. fact, a, a lot of expats did leave Hong Kong mm. in 2003, and many never returned. But we got through it. SARS mm. actually was the first time that I'd ever experienced mask wearing, which was always course, much yeah. more common across Asia. Yeah. It's been interesting for me over the past year or so, um, during the COVID pandemic, how mm. difficult it's been to get everyone to wear masks here in the UK, and how even in the US... It's it's become a hugely polarizing and politicized issue. Well, it really has. It's frightening, actually. But Hong Kong and the Asia Pacific region generally were, were amazing experiences, life changing experiences. We traveled all over the Asia region from Japan and South Korea in the north, 
to Thailand, Indonesia, Singapore, Malaysia, the Philippines in the south, even a few times down to Australia. And then over to the west, I went to India and Sri Lanka a lot on mm. business as well. Wow. I seem to actually spend several years living out of a suitcase um, and I racked up so many air miles I just didn't know what to do with them at one point I think I had more than a million air miles which is which is crazy but Barclays had big plans for its business across the Asia Pacific region mm. and after a year or two I became head of the financial institutions team for debt capital markets and in that role, I, I regularly met with bank presidents and CEOs, government officials, heads of central banks, mm. as Barclays continued to build its reputation and presence as a leader in that market. It, it was an exhilarating and rewarding time. Mm. But it did take its toll, especially on my marriage, with a young family uprooted halfway around the world. My wife didn't love the expat lifestyle. Mm. I was traveling so much. Virtually every week, I was flying somewhere sometimes even doing two trips in one week. Mm. Uh, and she eventually went back to the UK after about three years and took our daughter and son, then almost six and four, back to the UK. Mm. Um, losing my children like that and then going through a difficult divorce, there, any other kind, was without doubt the toughest thing I've had to cope with in my life. Oh, I'm sure. How difficult for you all at that point. It was. It, it was horrendous. And it led me to do a lot of soul searching. Um, I had an incredibly difficult decision to make. Mm. Either I went back to the UK and tried to restart my career there while being nearer my children, mm. but not living with them. Or I stayed in Hong Kong continue with the success that we'd been enjoying at Barclays, but see my children grow up half a world away. Mm. And that's what I did. Yeah. Seeing the children leaving my Hong Kong apartment in a taxi, tears flowing all around was, was the most heartbreaking moment of my life. It's seared on my memory. Yeah. Yeah. But life moves on. Um, the next day saw a new dawn. We all adapted to our new circumstances and we got on with things. Mm. But from that truly very low point, one very positive thing did happen. It forced me, I think, to reassess my life, yeah. regain some perspective on mm. what's important. It's not about money. It's not about success. It's about being happy. Mm. And I realized that you can have money, you can have a seemingly glamorous lifestyle, you can own properties all over the world, but if you're not happy, what's the point of it? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> seriously, what, what is the point? And, and the truth is, I, I had all that. I, I earned more money than I'd ever dreamed of, and yet I was miserable, and something had to change. I mean, life, by its very nature, just goes on for all of us. So, so what happened next, Richard? Well, I'd fallen out of love with investment banking. I'd done it for 15 years. I guess you could say I'd burned out, as you mm. mentioned earlier. Mm. So I left Barclays. It was quite an easy and natural thing to do at that time following mm. the financial crisis in the late 2000s. Um, and I then spent some time on personal investment projects. I got increasingly involved with smaller businesses, entrepreneurial ventures, investing in them, advising and mentoring mm. them. The British Chamber of Commerce in Hong Kong ran an excellent angel investment program. Uh -huh. It was a bit like the Dragon's Den TV show where entrepreneurs and early stage businesses were trying to raise finance for their, for their new business. Mm -hmm. Angel investors were usually wealthy individuals or family offices, of which there were many in Hong Kong. Right. And, and my role there was to screen applicants, mentor them through the whole process. And I got involved in a few businesses that raised funding through that program, mm -hmm. including one involved in business and commercial finance. By this time, I had a new partner, mm -hmm. and in 2012, I turned 40, and two months later, I got remarried in Hong Kong, <laughs> and then the next year, in 2013, our son Oliver was born. Uh -huh. Soon after that came a significant event in my life. Mm -hmm. I discovered running. 
Right. Um, okay. <laughs> I, I'd always played rugby in Hong Kong. Uh, actually, I played for Hong Kong Police RFC. Oh, did you? Uh, okay. was a, yeah. I did. It was a big <laughs> part of my life. I had some very good friends in the police in Hong Kong, mm. and we played in several tournaments, actually, around Asia uh, under the touring name of Old Bill RFC, believe it or not. That was their, <laughs> that was their name. <laughs> but eventually, age caught up with me in my late 30s. I was getting injured too too many times. Mm. Um, so I stopped playing rugby and took up running. And it's funny because I'd always hated running when younger and I would do anything I could to avoid the <laughs> dreaded cross country oh, yeah. at school. Uh, but over the past few years, running has become a huge part of my life. Uh. It just goes to show it's never too late to start up something new. Not that 40 is old, by the way, any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> it isn't. But um, you do take your running really seriously now. Well, I wouldn't say it's that serious, but I do okay. spend a lot of time doing it. Mm. Um, since 2015, I've run about 20 half marathons, something like that. Uh -huh. um, I've run two full marathons, the first of which was in New York, where my brother lives. Mm and one 50-kilometer ultramarathon in the Philippines, where my wife is from. Wow. And I can honestly <laughs> say that running has become one of my great and unexpected pleasures in life. Mm. I think I love the solitude. I love the thinking time. I love being up and about before the sun rises. It's just me and a few foxes and the occasional milk float, <laughs> um, listening to audio books or podcasts, including your own podcast, of course. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> um, I'm usually awake before five o'clock in the morning. I try to get the running done before the family's awake. Yeah. It really sets me up for the day. And I can tell you, Susanna, the runner's high is a real thing. It's been brilliant for my mental health as well as my physical right. health. Okay. <laughs> I'm never going to break any speed records. And I do pick up minor injuries from time to time, mm. but I really enjoy it. I, and there's a definite Definitely a certain addictive quality to it. And people often say to me, you know, I'm not a runner or I don't do running, but, but I can say this with more or less absolute certainty. If I can run for an hour, for two hours, or even occasionally four hours or more, then anyone can. I definitely don't have the natural body shape of a runner. So if I can do it, anyone can. I'm, I am so impressed and I'm curious actually about the runner's high because I've heard about it so often. I'm still considering getting out my running shoes, potentially. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you should. I, it's one of the best forms of exercise there is. And yeah. I think the trick is to start gradually, maybe with a few weeks of walking, which is exactly what I did in Hong Kong. And then over time, gradually incorporate some short runs into those walks mm -hmm. and then gradually increase the distance from a few hundred meters to half a kilometer to a kilometer to a mile and, and just gradually increase and yeah. just keep repeating, repeat, repeat, repeat. Uh -huh. And the body, the body adjusts to it, but also mind adjusts to it. So what seemed like an impossible challenge or milestone Within a few months, you'll be doing 5K, no problem. And then from there, the sky's the limit. It's all about <laughs> getting the body and the cardiovascular system used to it. And based on my experience, actually, the hardest milestone to reach is 5K, just over three miles right. um, or so. And then once your mind and your body are used to 5K, you can just keep extending the distance. So you're doing one longer run each week. And before you know it, like I did in 2015. <laughs> You'll be signing up to enter a half marathon. Oh, I don't know. I shall. I shall think about it. I really will think about it. But uh, more than just the running, you've actually achieved a great deal more with that running too. Well, I, I'm not a competitive runner or anything like that. I run for myself, so mm. you know I don't want to overstate my achievements because <laughs> they're very personal. They're achievements for me mm. rather than I'm uh, not racing against anybody no, else. No, but tell us. Tell us a few. Okay, well, there are two achievements, I think, that stand out. In 2016, I entered a 50K, which is about 31 miles ultra marathon mm -hmm. race in right. the southern Philippines, where my wife is from. Mm -hmm. The race started at 2 a.m. to mm -hmm. avoid the brutal daytime heat. So literally, 
there was no sleep that night. No. It was prepare the <laughs> evening before, try and get an hour's sleep, and then be up at one o'clock for this two o'clock race. Uh. The first 37 kilometers of that 50 kilometer race were all uphill. We were basically running up the foothills of a dormant volcano. I really don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> Amazingly, I actually came first in the 40 to 49 age category in, in a time of just under six hours. Mm, wow. Well, it sounds amazing, <laughs> but I've got to tell you, there were only eight of us in that age bracket. It doesn't matter. That is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, I think one of the achievements that I'm most proud of was running my first ever full marathon, which was the iconic New York City Marathon in 2015. Mm -hmm. I ran that with my brother. As I said, he, he lives there. And I dedicated myself to preparing and training for that for mm. more than 18 months. Mm. And it showed me that with enough persistence, with enough focus, enough dedication, we can overcome any obstacle and achieve anything we want. Absolutely. I'm so impressed. <laughs> well, thank you. The sport's always been a big passion of mine. Mm. Um, I'm a huge cricket fan. It's my favorite sport, actually. And mm. even though I played rugby for many years and I don't play rugby anymore, I'm delighted that Clear Idea Finance is supporting local rugby in Ipswich through our sponsorship of the Ipswich School Rugby Programme. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. The school has a really ambitious plan to become one of the leading rugby schools in the country. It has a top class coaching set up under head coach Jacob Board, who's the brother of England fly half George Board. Oh, right. Okay. And I can't, oh. I can't wait for the start of the next season so we can get out there and watch some live rugby again. <laughs> Gosh, don't get me into rugby. My goodness, we'll be here all day. So eventually <laughs> you left Hong Kong and returned to us here? Yes, eventually. Eventually, my wife and I decided that we'd had enough of Hong Kong. We'd mm -hmm. lived there together for several years. We got married. We'd had a baby. Mm -hmm. We had three dogs. Mm -hmm. um, and if you've ever seen the inside of a typical Hong Kong apartment, you'll know that vertical skyscraper living in shoebox-sized homes can be extremely claustrophobic. Uh, and we'd actually bought some land in the Philippines several years earlier, mm -hmm. and we decided to build a house there. But that didn't go according to plan. It turned out that trying to build a house remotely supervising it from Hong Kong was a bit of a disaster. Uh, so we ended up moving there about five years ago to finish the house, to mm -hmm. chill out for a year or so, and then decide where to go from there. Mm -hmm. Our house is in Davao City in the southern Philippines. It's the third largest city in the Philippines, right. in the valley of Mount Apo, which is a dormant volcano, the one I ran out actually in that ultramarathon, <laughs> and the tallest mountain in the Philippines. Uh -huh. It's a very rural agricultural area surrounded by miles and miles of fruit plantations, bananas, pineapples, mangoes, coconuts, wow. and rice fields as mm. well. Mm. Uh, my wife became pregnant again in 2019. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, our eldest son, Oliver, was struggling a bit with the school there. He'd been born in Hong Kong, obviously, mm -hmm. and he didn't speak the local languages, only English. Right. So we decided that the time was right for us to come back to the UK, mm -hmm. primarily so we could get Oliver into the UK school system before it was too late. I think he was five at the time, mm. but also so my wife could have the baby here. She's Filipino mm -hmm. uh, and the visa process took months. So I went backwards and forwards between the UK and the Philippines a few times during 2019, making preparations. Mm. And then the rest of the family came over towards the end of the year. And then at the end of January 2020, mm -hmm. our son Edward was born at Ipswich Hospital. Mm. He's a true Suffolk boy. Um, <laughs> Oliver had started by that time at Ipswich Prep School and mm. then within weeks, the COVID pandemic hit. I was about to say, gosh, timing. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So we had a new baby. COVID was happening. Then the schools closed. First lockdown and I was straight into homeschooling. Um, that was a real challenge. <laughs> Uh, honestly, that yeah. was one of the hardest things I've ever had to do in my life. Uh, um, Oliver had a lot of catching up to do because he'd spent past few years in the Philippines and, and Hong Kong. Uh, but because of the lockdown, it meant that I was able to give him one-on-one -on -one support. So actually, in many ways, I think the homeschooling was very good for him. Yeah. 
it certainly made me appreciate how difficult it is to educate young children. And my respect for teachers has gone through the roof over the last year. <laughs> yeah, right. But at the time, I didn't have working commitments. So it also gave me plenty of time to really figure out what I was going to do with myself work-wise. Mm. And that's how Clear Idea Finance was born. So what does Clear Idea do? Well, we help businesses raise money. Mm -hmm. Our clients are business owners, entrepreneurs, property developers, property investors. Mm -hmm. We advise them on their options for commercial finance, and we help them to find the finance they need to grow their business or finance their next project. Mm -hmm. So it might be a property development, which is a particularly busy sector for us currently. Mm -hmm. It might be a property purchase from auction. Mm -hmm. It might be asset finance, equipment finance, invoice or trade finance, or the client might need money to finance the acquisition of another company. Mm. Whatever it is, so long as it's commercial finance, Clear Idea can help. Right. Okay. I think one of the most stressful parts of running a business is ensuring you have enough money. All businesses go through rough patches, and goodness knows we've been through the mother of all rough patches over the past year or so. <laughs> I could yeah. put it more eloquently myself. It's the um, it's the cash flow which has stopped for, for so many of us, and it's frightening. Yes, it is. Think of all the things that can cause stress for business owners, ensuring access to finance whenever they need it is right up there in terms of cold, sweat-inducing, sleepless nights. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but when you apply for funding from your bank and your bank says no, where, where do you go next? If you want uh, to borrow money to buy a property from auction, who do you speak to? Uh, if you're looking for finance for a property development, whether it's a ground-up new build project or a conversion or a refurbishment project, but you've no idea where to start looking for finance, where do you go? Uh, or an, if an opportunity comes up to buy your business premises or if you want to buy another company and you need help with the finance, who do you turn to for help? Uh, in all of those examples, it can be really difficult, if not impossible, to get help from your high street bank. I spent 15 years working for two of the largest banks in Europe, and I can tell you that for all their friendly TV and radio ads and glossy marketing, the big banks really don't like lending to small businesses. No, small businesses cost them money, I guess. Yes, it's expensive and it's also risky. It's very people intensive. The banks need to maintain large teams of staff to look after these clients. They have relationship managers, credit analysts, underwriters, collections. It's also expensive in terms of capital. Banks are required by regulators to maintain certain capital reserves as a form of insurance, a safety buffer in case they get into trouble. Yeah. And lower risk loans require less capital. An example would be a residential mortgage loan. The loan is secured against the property, so the loan is very low risk for a bank. Yeah. But loans to businesses are often unsecured, which means the bank is taking much more risk, and so they're required to allocate more capital, more insurance against each loan. Yeah. However, all is not lost. I don't want to sound all doom and gloom no. about this. There are actually some 300 commercial lenders in the UK. And outside of the high street banks and perhaps a few of the so-called challenger banks, the newer, leaner, often online banks looking to disrupt the industry, most people have never heard of these lenders. They don't have branch networks. They may only have a single office or they may specialize in a very niche sector such as property development lending. I had absolutely no idea there were so many lenders in the UK. But then how would I know? <laughs> I mean, I just wouldn't. I mean, I would always tend to look to my private bank or just to mainstream brands. That's remarkable. So, so how do you work with your clients? Well, we start every new client relationship by talking to the client to understand their business and their financial needs. Mm -hmm. We'll explore different kinds of commercial finance. Not everyone is suitable for every business. And because we have relationships and work with so many different lenders, we'll generally know which ones are best suited to a particular situation. Mm. 
I'm very focused on creating the right kind of ethos and brand for Clear Idea. Mm. The world of commercial finance and commercial finance brokers does have something of a tainted reputation, unfortunately. Mm. And I think a lot of that comes down to regulation. Uh, for a long time, commercial finance was largely unregulated. And this is very different when we compare commercial finance to consumer finance, mm. where regulation is everywhere. There are lots of rules about what lenders can and can't do, mm -hmm. how they can advertise, how they calculate and disclose interest rates and fees, all the disclaimer messages that we see on correspondence or adverts mm, yeah. from banks and credit mm -hmm. card providers, for example. So in the consumer finance world, regulation exists primarily to protect consumers, to prevent people right. being taken advantage of, mm -hmm. to avoid people making bad financial decisions and ultimately losing money. Mm. You know, it's all designed to ensure that the experts we go to are sufficiently qualified. In other words, they have the technical knowledge and the practical expertise to give sound advice to their clients. Mm. But in the commercial finance world, it's always been quite different. Business owners are deemed, rightly or wrongly, to be sophisticated enough to make their own financial decisions without the same level of regulatory protection. Mm. And so in the commercial finance, none of that protection exists, none. Anyone can set themselves up as a commercial finance broker, and trust me, anyone does. Thankfully, this is changing, and the level of regulation in the commercial finance world, while still a long way behind the levels of protection we see in consumer finance, is slowly catching up. That's so interesting. I didn't know that from the commercial aspect. So why are you doing this? Banking and finance is what I've always done. It's what I know. And raising money for my clients is in my professional DNA. Mm -hmm. And I like helping people. I'm mm -hmm. passionate about small businesses. I love taking on complicated business situations and figuring out a solution. Mm -hmm. Suppose I want to use my years of experience working at world-class banking groups and applying that to the commercial finance sector. I think ultimately it means putting the clients first, giving them outstanding service, mm -hmm. being responsive, helping them navigate the complex maze and, and ultimately solving their problems and providing the best possible solution. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because... I don't think finance is really as complicated as the finance people would have us believe. I think I would feel considerably safer with you managing our business finances. It's the trust. <laughs> it's the trust, though, isn't it? Absolutely, it is. And, and my job is to make my clients feel like they're in safe hands, mm. that we'll hold their hands and walk them through the process. And in fact, we often say, and we, you'll see it on our website, mm. you focus on running your business and let us take care of the finance. Like it. I like it a lot. You've worked fast to get Clear Idea up and running in a relatively short and turbulent period. Yes, I set the business up during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, why not? <laughs> I've always been a huge fan of musical theatre. And one of my all-time favourite films is Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. <laughs> my favourite song from that film is The Roses of Success. And if you, if you, can, go, you can go onto YouTube and have a look at it. It's there. It's a, it's a wonderful song. And one of the lines in there is, From the ashes of disaster grow the roses of success. <laughs> I'd love you to play it. I don't know whether that's possible. Oh, my goodness. We'd love to. But um, we'd have to pay quite a bit of money for the royalties to do so. But, but perhaps, <laughs> hey, perhaps you can help us with that. <laughs> well, indeed, indeed. But I do. I love that song. And it's a brilliant song about how to use failure to spur you on to mm. future success. Mm. And, and look, I, yes, I set the business up during COVID, but it was nothing to do with COVID. The truth is... Businesses always need to manage their finances carefully in good times and bad times. Mm. And look, I'm old enough to have lived through several economic booms and busts, going right back to the Asian financial crisis of the late 90s. Mm. There'll always be a need for high quality financial advice. So it, it doesn't concern me that I started the business during the pandemic. Mm. I think on the contrary, it's given me the opportunity to really take my time to establish the business carefully, to develop important relationships with clients, with lenders and other partners, and to establish trust and credibility with them, all of which hopefully 
will provide a solid platform from which Clear Idea can grow its own roses of success. <laughs> Nicely put. But we, So which parts of the business are you concentrating on the most? A major focus for us is to build and nurture a network of what we call introducers. Mm. And introducers are usually professional services firms such as accountants or solicitors, financial advisors, business brokers, auction houses, basically any firm or anyone, it doesn't have to be a business, Mm. who might have clients or contacts that from time to time might need commercial finance. Mm -hmm. Of course, we're always delighted when a potential client comes to us directly, might be through our website or Mm -hmm. through an internet search or Mm -hmm. through some LinkedIn marketing that we've been running, or perhaps they heard me being interviewed on radio, which I've done a few times Mm -hmm. recently. Mm -hmm. But there's nothing better I think, than when a client is referred to us by someone they already trust, such Mm. as their accountant or solicitor or even their bank. I was referred a client only yesterday, actually, by a high street bank. The bank couldn't help the client, but they thought that Clear Idea could, which is absolutely fantastic. Mm. Of course, we need to build trust and credibility with those firms. Why would anyone put their reputation or even their own relationship with that client on the line Mm. unless they know that we have the technical expertise, not only to help deliver what the client's looking for in terms of finance, Mm. but also that will treat the client as professionally as they would themselves. In other words, Mm. we'll look after them. Mm. And so far, I think this is going really well. We've developed some good relationships with several accounting firms, business brokers, financial advisors, solicitors, and we're already seeing a steady stream of inquiries on behalf of their clients Mm. for all kinds of commercial finance, whether it's buy to let property finance, property development, finance, acquisition, invoice, trade finance, finance for agricultural vehicles and machinery, which obviously is a big uh, field, a big sector locally in the region. Of course. Gosh, you really do have a diverse client base. Yes, we do. And that variety is one of the things that I love about this business. Mm. No two clients or situations are the same. Obviously, I have clients locally in East Anglia, Mm -hmm. but we're certainly not limited to this region. We have clients in London, the Lake District, Cornwall, Birmingham, Liverpool, and across the UK. We've got clients in Northern Ireland, Scotland, and Wales too. Um, So it keeps things exciting. It keeps things fresh and interesting. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's really important. Mm -hmm. Um, If I think if I've learned anything through my life, it's to keep things fresh and not allowing them to grow stale. Mm -hmm. If they grow stale, then you're not performing at the highest possible level. And that potentially means that it will take much longer to grow those roses of success. <laughs> yeah. My objective with Clear Idea is to establish the business as the leading and most trusted commercial finance advisor in East Anglia. Mm-hmm. There are around a quarter of a million small businesses in Suffolk and the three surrounding counties, about 100,000 in Essex and then about 50,000 in each of Suffolk, Norfolk and Cambridgeshire. That's an awful lot of businesses. I can't believe it. Surely too much work for one man. Yes, it it will be. Mm. Um, But I am looking to grow the team. I did start the business alone. I got myself an office at Saracen's House in Ipswich, Mm -hmm. right opposite the church on St. Margaret's Green and in sight of Christchurch Mansion, which is one of my favorite buildings in the world. (laughs) And while I work with a lot of people for things like marketing and business development, content creation and so on, I felt it was really important for me to roll my sleeves up and do as much as I could by myself for Mm. as long as possible so that I could learn every aspect of how to run this business as efficiently and successfully as I can Mm. and ultimately how to take the business forward as it grows. Mm -hmm. And as it does grow and gains traction, I want to be able to bring people into the team so that they can have a clearly defined role and they can participate and share in the success of a growing business. Mm. So how do people approach you, Richard? They can look at our website, Mm clearideafinance.com. They can email me, which is richard at clearideafinance.com. People can also find me and the company on LinkedIn. Now, before you go, I just wanted to know a bit more about your kids, if that's okay with you. Of course. (laughs) You mentioned you have four of them 
and four is a familiar number to Mark and me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do. I never planned to have four kids. Mm-hmm. It's funny how life works out. Mm-hmm. I've got two sets of kids, as I've mm-hmm. indicated. I've got my two older kids, Emma and William, 21 and 19. Mm-hmm. And then I've got my two younger sons, Oliver and Edward, who are seven years old and 16 months in a few days. 16 months, how lovely. (laughs) Yeah, so quite a spread in ages, one girl Mm -hmm. and then three boys. Mm -hmm. Um, It was never really in my life plan to have a baby in my late 40s, (laughs) but I've got to say it's been wonderful to be a father again and to do it properly, if you will, without the stress of a high-pressured career working brutal hours that meant I never saw my children grow up. Mm. I think one of my biggest regrets in my life is that I didn't spend as much time with my older children as I could have done, perhaps even should have done, especially since I stayed in Hong Kong after they returned to the UK at such a young age. Mm. I now have a close relationship with all my children. Emma, as I mentioned, is about to start her final exams at Cambridge, Mm -hmm. hopefully be graduating in just over a month. My eldest son, Will, he will hopefully be joining one of the world's most prestigious car companies quite Mm -hmm. soon. Mm -hmm. Oliver, who's seven, is now doing really well at school, having done a lot of catching up since he's been in the UK. And young Edward, he's 16 months, as I, as I mentioned. He's running around the house like a mad thing, keeping us all on our toes. <laughs> Good for Edward. <laughs> it sounds idyllic. It really does. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it is. It is. <laughs> Richard, thank you so much for joining us. We wish you every success with Clear Idea. And we'll keep an eye out for the Ipswich School rugby team next season. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Susanna. I've really enjoyed our chat. I'm (laughs) flattered that you invited me onto the show. Um, It's an excellent show, by the way, and you're clearly getting a a widespread following. So I wish you and Mark every success with it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before I go, if I may just like to thank a few people, if that's all right. Of course, please. I promise I won't turn this into an Oscar speech. (laughs) Um, But I, I would like to thank my wife, Eileen, for whom... It really was a monumental decision to leave the Philippines and her family two years ago, Mm -hmm. travel halfway around the world to the UK, heavily pregnant. Mm -hmm. She gave birth, of course, right before the first lockdown and has had to deal with everything involved with looking after a baby in a foreign country without her own family around Mm -hmm. her while I was busy trying to launch this business. Also, I'd like to thank of my professional contacts, partners, lenders, introducers, many of whom I now call friends who have helped me to navigate this latest journey and helped me to reintegrate back into Suffolk life. Mm -hmm. Finally, a special mention to my parents who have been, I've got to say, incredibly supportive throughout my life from my school days to give me the opportunities that I've had and who provided so much support to me and my family in the two years that we've been back in the UK. Well, thank you, Richard. And we hopefully will see you soon. And thank you again for being on the Suffolk Pod Show. Oh, it's been an absolute pleasure, Susanna. (laughs) Thank you so much for having me. Okay. Thanks for listening to the Suffolk Pod Show. Find us on Facebook, Twitter or Instagram. Or you can visit our website, podtalk.co.uk. And here's our disclaimer. The Suffolk Pod Show will not be held responsible for any omissions or errors in its podcast. The Suffolk Pod Show is produced purely for entertainment purposes. Views and opinions are that of our own or that of our guests.